بسم الله الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ونوله ما بعد. So we were still doing uh, the غزوة of مريسيع, uh, the expedition of مريسيع, and we said the غزوة of مريسيع is important not so much for the battle itself, but for the three things that happen after the battle. And we talked about the first of those three things being what? What was the first of those three? So. The marriage of the Prophet with Juwaidiyah, which led to the entire tribe being freed and then converting to Islam and then being returned to their property. And so everything remained the same except that they were now Muslim, right? And uh, the marriage of Juwaidiyah truly illustrates the plurality of our Prophet uh, marriages. Uh, we're going to do the second incident today and then start the third incident as well. Uh, and the third incident is the slander of Aisha, so we'll start that at the end. So the second incident, which we weren't able to discuss, and by the way, as we mentioned last time, and our uh, brother also brought up the issue of the date of Muraysir. And as I said, I mean, I, I, Alhamdulillah, this is a very advanced seerah, but still there's a time you just have to draw. Uh, but nonetheless, no problem in mentioning some of the controversies. So Muraysir when did it occur and therefore when did the slander occur and when did the marriage of Juwaidi occur all of it is depending on when does Muraysi occur so there's many positions about this but there's two very strong positions the first of these is that in the fifth year of the Hijra Sha'ban the second in the sixth year of the Hijra Sha'ban difference of one year now this is a theoretical difference it doesn't really matter frank, frankly speaking doesn't change anything right it's just a historical uh, question, when did Muraysiya take, pl take place and when did therefore uh, the marriage of the Prophet and then the slander of Aisha, when did it take place? This is uh, two major positions and the problem is, and again this is a little bit advanced, but nonetheless, let us to mention a little bit about it. The problem comes, people are remembering narratives many years after they happened. And piecing together all of the narratives, there's two individuals mentioned, both of which could not have been alive or pre present in the story in the same year. That's why this controversy occurs. Okay, Two names are mentioned and both of these names are clashing with each other in terms of chronology. And both of these names are mentioned in Bukhari and both of these have authentic Asanid. Right? This is the problem. And just again, a little bit of background. So one of the uh, individuals is Sa'd ibn Mu'adh. Now, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, Sa'd ibn Mu'adh, he dies right after Khandaq. He would not have been alive in the sixth year Sha'ban. Impossible. Because Khandaq takes place when? Fifth year Shawwal. Right? And he dies one month after that. Okay? So, those who say, this incident took place fifth year Sha'ban, everything fits. So far, so clear. Correct? So far, so clear. Because Sha'ban, Ramadan, Shawwal. Okay? Now, who's the other person mentioned? The other person mentioned is Zainab bint Jahsh. Now, Zainab bint Jahsh is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. She did not become his wife, except in the end of the fifth year. So if we say this incident took place in Sha'ban of the fifth year, Zainab is not yet his wife, so they say then Sha'ban of the sixth year. But then how does Sa'ad Sa ibn Mu'adh come in? So one of the two figures historically is incorrect. The memories of the people narrating got messed up and confused. Now that's just one issue, then there are many other issues as well that are much more trivial. And as I have mentioned many times, one of the biggest problems that Sira researchers have is to piece together the stories of the Sira to form a complete narrative and also to make a chronology. When did exactly these things happen? It's not that easy. And Ibn Ishaq has a position and at tabari has a position. So from the very beginning we've had this ikhtilaf about when did Muraysiya occur, when did all of this occur. And so again, just so that you should be aware, uh, what we're following now is fifth year Sha'ban. But frankly, there is a strong case to be made, which our brother brought some points up, a strong case to be made, sixth year Sha'ban. And honestly, nothing different is to be, so what? I mean, whichever of the two positions takes place, it's a historical curiosity. Right? When did it take place? So, 
Do realize though that the majority of Sira books are following Ibn Ishaq. Ibn Ishaq says sixth year Sha'ban. So the majority of Sira books will not be discussing what I see when I'm discussing it. But most modern researchers that are a little bit more critical, because 90% of Sira researchers, they took Ibn Ishaq as the model. Khalas. Whatever he says goes. They just were easy with it. Ibn Ishaq was considered to be the main authority of Sira. Modern researchers, they make Ibn Ishaq one authority amongst many authorities. And they're a little bit more critical. Ma the majority of modern muhaqqiqun, which means like the modern researchers, they have concluded with many other evidences that Muraysi'ah took place Sha'ban of the fifth year of the Hijrah. And the mention of Sa'ad ibn Mu'adh is correct. And therefore, either Zainab bin Tijash was not a wife and only a cousin because she was a cousin, right? Or it's just a mistake in that it wasn't actually Zainab bin Tijash, it was somebody else. And if you want to hold this position, that's fine. If you want to hold the other position, that is fine as well. In any case, back to the story. So, what is the second of the three incidents? The second of the three incidents involved the return journey from the battle back to Medina. And as I had mentioned before, the battle of Muraysi'ah, the majority of the hypocrites participated in it. Why? Because it was number one, very close. Number two, there was no harvest season, so there's no temptation to stay. Number three, there's a guaranteed win. There's no chance of failure. And there was no casualty at Muraysi'ah except an accidental friendly fire casualty. There was zero casualties at Muraysi'ah. It was guaranteed win. So seeing the guaranteed win, all of the hypocrites, and at the head of them, Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul participated. He had never participated in any expedition before or after. So Muraysi'ah had the largest concentration of hypocrites. Tensions are bound to happen, and that's why two of the three stories involve hypocrites. Number one, this one. Number two, slander of Aisha, which is all about the hypocrites as well. Right? So why are the hypocrites playing a central role in this Muraysi'ah? Because they have the highest concentration ever in any expedition. Things are bound to happen. In Tabuk, and other things happen, but Abdullah ibn Ubay did not participate in Tabuk. He wasn't there in Tabuk, right? He, this is the only major expedition Abdullah ibn Ubay is a part of. So what happened? The story goes as follows. And by the way, I did not mention before that Abdullah ibn Ubay, uh, obviously, actually I did mention this, I think, uh, he had converted reluctantly. When did he convert? Who can remind me? When did he convert? After Badr. After Badr. When it was clear that there's no point in remaining a pagan, he was one of the last people to convert. And before he converted, he has some very, very harsh statements. This is before his conversion. In the first year and a half before Badr, uh, that once uh, <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ passed by riding his donkey, and Abdullah ibn Ubay snuck his nose up and put his hand on his nose and said, Don't bring this stench when you walk by me. Is he saying that to the Prophet? ﷺ. But now at this point in time, he's a pagan, he not, has not uh, converted. And he would also tell uh, the Prophet ﷺ and the Muslim was when they recited the Quran to lower their voices and not to disturb him. Don't disturb you when I'm sleeping with your uh, recitation or with your salah, with your adhan. So clearly there was a kibbutz or arrogance from the very beginning. And then uh, after Badr he was forced to accept Islam, meaning he realized there's no hope in remaining uh, a mushrik. And at Uhud we all know what he had done. Now in Muraysi'ah he's burning inside and something took place where he made some very harsh comments. What happened? It is mentioned that one Ansari and one Muhajir amongst the young uh, men of both sides, they went to collect water for the caravan. And on the way, just like youth do, they began uh, disputing over something and so one of them kicked the other. And the other responded back with a punch. And the two began fist fighting. As the kids do all the time, they get into some dispute over something, and so they started fighting each other. Immediately the Muhajir said, O oh, Muhajirun, come and help me. And the Ansar said, O oh, Ansars, come and help me. They're screaming out. So the Muhajirun came to see what's happening, the Ansar came to see what's happening. Each one of them sided with their own youth, their own member. And the both of them, whatever the dispute was, we actually don't even know, subhanAllah. 
And this is of the wisdom of the Sahaba, as we said many times, they don't record these petty details. We don't know what was the issue going on. It's not mentioned. And there's no need for us to know. And so the two of them began disputing, the Muhajirun and the Ansar. And their voices began to shout and increase. And they started lining up and yelling and screaming. And tempers flared, weapons were about to be drawn. Tempers flared and weapons were about to be drawn. And the Prophet ﷺ heard all of this commotion, what's going on, the noise is raising. So he rushes outside of his tent and he sees the Ansar on one side, the Muhajirun on the other side. All lined up, yelling, shouting, screaming, anger is there. And so he asks, what is going on? What are you doing? And they tell him that the, these two youth, they had a fight. We, they called out the Ansar, or they called out the Muhajirun. Now we are resolving the dispute. Again, we don't know what the dispute is. So the Prophet ﷺ said, Abi da'wal jahiliyyah, you're going back to the calls of jahiliyyah. You're going back to this breaking up of the ummah based upon lines and divisions. That's what jahiliyyah was about. This is Qurashi, this is Hudali, this is Thaqafi. You're going back to the da'wah of jahiliyyah. Utrukuha fa innaha muntina. Leave it because it is disgusting. He used a very harsh word. Muntina, rotting. It's disgusting. Get rid of it. It is something that is disgusting. Throw it away. It's something that's rotting. Now, uh, before we move on, look over here, subhanAllah, how weak human nature is. This is the best generation of mankind ever. Kuntum khayra ummatin nas. And two youth get involved fighting. Whatever it is, it's got to be petty. These are two youth. Whether it's over who's going to get the water first, whether whatever is the story, it's got to be something, you know, teenagers fight over. But still, tempers are so easy to flare. And divisions and calls like this, Iblis is waiting to divide the Muslim ummah up in this manner. And even the best of ummahs and generations, the potential exists for this to flare up. And this is exactly what happened. And in this we see the humanity of the Sahaba. They're not angels. They can get angry. They almost break into a fight themselves. After the death of the Prophet an actual fight will occur. Multiple fights will occur. Safin and Jamal, they will occur. They didn't want it to happen, but nonetheless it happened. We also see over here that the Prophet ﷺ called racism and ethnic division, he called it rotting, filthy, muntina. It's something that's decaying. And this shows us dividing ourselves up when we are one ummah over any divisions is something that is completely filthy. It's the human nature should find it disgusting. Like imagine rotting flesh. This is how we should find racism. This is how we should find division within the ummah. And what is especially noteworthy in this division is that this division, Ansar and Muhajir, was unknown to the both of them four years ago, five years ago. This is a brand new division. And it is a division that the Quran itself sanctions. Al Muhajirun wal Ansar. It is an Islamic division. Who's a Muhajir? Who's an Ansar? Yet it can be misused and abused as it was right now. And even this Islamic division can become un Islamic. If this is the case with something that has Quranic origin, Muhajir and Ansar, how about something that has completely human origin? This is Arab, this is Pakistani, this is Bengali, this is Indian, this is Egyptian, this is Syrian. Or not even this, this is from this place in the Punjab and this is from that village in the Punjab. Imagine. And this is how it becomes. This is from North Egypt, this is from South Egypt. This is from this place in Sudan, that's from that place in Sudan. Subhanallah, if these divisions that are Quranic, our Prophet ﷺ said it's filthy and disgusting if it is used in this manner. Muntina for something that the Quran itself approves if used correctly. If it's used incorrectly, it becomes disgusting. How about the divisions that are imaginary and man-made? How do they fall into the scheme of things, right? And this shows us the filth and the inherent un-Islamic uh, concept known as racism. Uh, now, this also shows us as well, by the way, how did the Prophet solve this? He didn't get involved in the petty details, who said what and what happened. 
He just said, get over it, da'uha, leave it. Some disputes, you don't need to go to the nitty gritty. Who said this? Who started it? It's his wisdom. This is actually going to cause worse problems. And this shows us when you're going to arbitrate between two people who are having a dispute, you need to use a lot of wisdom. Sometimes you need to go down to the mind you say. Who said what? When did they say it? Sometimes it's just best when this is happening, they're about to draw their swords, they're made to feel like foolish. How could we have gotten to this? Come on, forget about it. Come on, you're all brothers. Bismillah, let's move on. And the matter is forgotten. And this is of his wisdom, so Wasallam, that he did not get involved in the mind you say. Who did what? Who started it? Who kicked whom? All of this is not even asked. Because that's actually going to do what? It's going to make it much worse. And this is of his wisdom, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. When Abdullah ibn Ubay heard this, he became inflamed, he became angry. Why did he become angry? Because he was happy to see the division. Because this division is something he wants to spread. And he wanted something to take place. When the fitna was quelled and the fire was basically quenched, he became irritated. And he said, is this what they have done? Meaning the Sahaba, they stopped fighting. They, meaning the Muhajirun, have competed with us in their numbers and their quantities. In their number and in their quantity. Quality and quantity. And this is exactly like, then he mentioned a very vulgar expression of Arabic, which translates in English as, fatten your dog only so that it will come back to eat you. That's an expression. Means something. What does it mean? It means it's very possible that the very uh, person or friend or whatever that you're helping, it's actually going to become an enemy to you. And so astaghfirullah, he called the Muslims and yani their leader, even astaghfirullah, he's comparing them to la hawla la billah, this animal. So good, this is exactly like this saying of Arabic. And he mentioned this saying that this is just like we say that fatten your dog and it's going to come back and eat you or bite you. By Allah, wallahi, la irraja'na ila al madinati. When we come back to the, uh, the city, la yukhrijanna al a'azzu. Min hal adhan. The ones who have more honor will expel the ones who have no honor. لَإِن رَجَعْنَا إِلَى الْمَدِينَةِ لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْ هَلْ أَذَلْ When we get back to Medina, now we're going to get rid of these people. The ones who have honor will get rid of those who have no honor. And then he started blaming his own hypocrites and he said you have brought this on yourselves you have allowed them to come into your land you have given them your money you have shared your wealth if only you withheld all of this they would have been forced to go back to their own homes so he's irritated his own people that look at what's happened now and this shows us that by this time the muhajirun their quantity really was rivaling that of the ansar now the people that were now emigrating has been now five years since the Hijrah, right? So the number of Muhajirun, and it's not just from Medina, from, from Mecca, sorry, all over people are coming, all over the place. Now their quantity has increased, and no doubt there is this sense of jealousy, of protection, of racism from this hypocrite Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. Now he's saying this in his private tent. Amongst his people who are, majority of them, they are munafiqun. But there was a young lad amongst them whose heart was full of iman. And his name was Zayd ibn Arqam. Zayd ibn Arqam. And Zayd ibn Arqam, when he heard this, he could not believe. I mean, this is clear kufr. Nobody can deny this, right? It is clear-cut kufr, making fun of the Prophet ﷺ, saying, Kufr statements, the statement that he said, comparing Audhu Billah, he could not believe this. And so he rushed to his uncle. He's a, he's a teenager, he doesn't know what to do. He rushes to his uncle, he says, I heard such and such. His uncle says, Let's go to the Prophet. He takes him to the Prophet. He says, Oh, Rasulullah, listen to what my nephew has, has just heard. And so he narrates to him what he has heard directly from. Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul's mouth. And Abdullah ibn Ubay is called by the Prophet. Did you just say this? 
and he begins giving qasam after qasam, swearing the the the, the riwayat say the ashad uh, the most strongest qasams imaginable, and this is a munafiq completely lying through his teeth, mentioning Allah's names completely in vain. He gives the strongest qasam, all the qasams he can think of, that he could never have said this, and this is a kid, how can you believe him, etc., etc. And so the Prophet ﷺ accepted the excuses of Ibn Ubay. After all, he's giving all of these qasams, and after all, it is a very harsh things that have been said. It's just better to hope he didn't say it. It's very harsh things have been said. And this caused a huge issue between the Munafiqoon and between the Ansar of Medina. Because obviously the Munafiqoon supported Abdullah ibn Ubay and the Ansar were already fumed at him and they're even more irritated. Umar ibn al-Khattab, after Abdullah ibn Ubay left, he said, Ya Rasulullah, let me just get rid of this guy. Always he has this role in the seerah. Right? Let me just get rid of this guy. Da'ani adribu unuqahu. Right? It is a munafiq, we all know he is a munafiq. And he insisted that there is no excuse for him now, Ya Rasulullah. And the Prophet ﷺ said, Da'hu, leave him, don't kill him. Why? Because I do not want the people to say that Muhammad ﷺ kills his own companions. We'll get back to this point. Leave him, I don't want the people to start spreading rumors about me that I execute my own companions. And he immediately ordered all of the Sahaba of the army to pack their bags and rush back to Medina. Stop all of this chattering, all of this chit chat, all of this qila wa qal, pack your bags, let's go. And he marched non stop for over 20 hours. Completely non stop for the rest of the whole day and the entire night. Non-stop marching, such that pretty much the next morning they were outside of Medina. Why? Because as soon as they basically stopped outside of Medina, khalas, they fell asleep for the rest of the day. They said as soon as their heads hit the pillow, after 20 hour walk what's going to happen, right? Now what was the wisdom of this? To get the minds off of all, all of this that's happening. Stop all of this chit chat. Stop all of the rumor mongering, just to get... Move on, just come on, let's go. And they are so tired, they just have no time to start gossiping because this is human nature. Small thing happens, and then one person throws it to another, it becomes bigger, throws it to another, becomes bigger, small thing becomes bigger and bigger, each person inflames the other. How dare he, he couldn't have done this, blah, blah, blah. SubhanAllah, the Prophet in his wisdom once again shows us his wisdom. He just completely extinguished this flame by just marching forward. Let's go. And by the time they walk 20 hours, as soon as they unpack their bags, they just fall right there asleep, sleep the whole day, wake up, Medina's right there. So then they get back uh, to the city of Medina. Now, Zayd ibn Arqam became very depressed. Because after all, his testimony has been rejected. Right? He became very depressed. He said it was the worst day of my life. After all, he's also just a teenager as well. And well, like, even if he had been an old man, it would have been very painful. The Prophet has rejected his testimony, basically. I mean, obviously, he's not accusing him of lying. But in essence, what has he done? In essence, he's accepted the testimony of Abdullah ibn Ubay and rejected the testimony of Zayd ibn Arqam. And Zayd ibn Arqam was extremely... Uh, depressed, he said it was the worst uh, day that my mother ever gave birth to me. The expression in Arabic, it's like the worst day of my life. And right that morning, outside of Medina, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala revealed all of the entirety of Surah Al Munafiqun. The whole Surah Al Munafiqun comes down in this battle, after this battle. Right? All of their qasams and it's just a shield. Right? They're just preventing people from the way of Allah. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala goes on. Allah knows they're lying. Allah knows this. Allah knows that. They will swear to you this. And the whole ayah and, the, and, and then in the surah, of course, Abdullah ibn Ubay is quoted by exact expression. This is quoting Abdullah ibn Ubay. Literally, it's in the Quran to this day. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, قُلْ فَلِلَّهِ الْعِزَّةُ وَلِرَسُولِي وَلِلْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَلَكِنَّ الْمُنَافِقِينَ لَا يَفْقَهُونَ 
right? Allah to Allah belongs all izza and to his Rasul and to the believers, the Munafiqun have no knowledge, they have no understanding. And the whole surah is basically a criticism of the Munafiqun and exposing of the faults of the Munafiqun. And uh, when this surah was revealed, <coughs> <coughs> the Prophet ﷺ called Zayd ibn Arqam, held him by the ear, and he said, Allah has confirmed that this has spoke, has heard the truth. Allah has confirmed this, has heard, heard the truth. Your ears have been confirmed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? So to calm him down, that after all the kid was feeling uh, so hurtful and painful, so the Prophet cheered him up and said that Allah has affirmed that your ears have uh, heard the truth. And the news had spread in Medina, what is happening? This is again, I mean, uh, when the army is about to come in, this was the sunnah of all armies of the past, there's a crier that comes basically to tell the people that uh, the army is coming, get ready. And the crier also brings information. And so all of this is spreading in the city of Medina. And Abdullah ibn Ubay's son hears of this. And his name, by the way, was also Abdullah. Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay. And he was a believer. He was not a munafiq. And Abdullah ibn Abdullah, the son of the leader of the hypocrites, when he heard about all of this, he went outside to meet the Prophet before he comes in. And he says to him, Ya Rasulullah, it has reached me that you're considering executing my father. And if you command anybody to execute him, now remember, he's grown up in Jahiliya times. He still has the ways of Jahiliya. He says, I don't think that I can see another man walk around in the streets of Medina knowing he's killed my father, except that I'll have to kill him. And if I kill him, I've killed an innocent Muslim, I'm going to go to Jahannam. So I think the only solution is you command me to do this execution. He's worried. This is what he's worried about now. Right? Like he has spent the last night sleepless. That what am I going to do now? If somebody else executes him, I cannot remain. Now again, this was primarily in their Jahili custom. That was the way it was. That it's your tribal loyalty. It's your, no matter how much you hate or don't like, that's why the Prophet himself was protected by his own tribe. Right? It's that loyalty that they have. And he's raised in that environment. So he said, if you command anybody else to kill him, I don't think I can withhold my sword from him. He's going to die. And if he dies from my hand, then khalas I'm, khalas, I'm done. The only alternative, you tell me, give me the commandment, so that I cannot blame anybody but myself. Subhanallah. I mean, this is uh, a real sign of obedience to Allah and His Messenger. A real sign of, there's no alternative other than, I'll have to do this deed. And our Prophet wasallam said to him, لا بل أحسن صحبته No. Rather, your duty is to be good companion to him. You cannot do this to him. Your duty is to be a good son or a good, you know, be loyal to him basically. And he promised him, the Prophet promised him, that we shall be good to him and gentle with him as long as he lives with us. So he promised Abdullah ibn Abdullah that, look, as long as your father is alive, we're not going to do anything to him. And that was his promise, that he uh, lived up to him, and that's exactly what he did. So, when he got this news, he felt a big sigh of relief, but he was still very angry at his father. And so, he stood at the gate of Medina, waiting for Abdullah ibn Ubay, his own father, to come. And when he came, he said that, you were the one who said, لَيُخْرِجَنَّ الْأَعَزُّ مِنْهَا الْأَذَلْ Right? And wallahi, I will not allow you to come back to Medina until the Prophet ﷺ has given you permission. His own son became basically the preventer. How dare you say this? And then you're going to come back to the city? I'm not going to let you do this until the Prophet ﷺ himself gives you permission. And uh, therefore he had to wait until the Prophet ﷺ came and then gave him permission to enter the city. And then Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, entered the city. Now, subhanAllah, this is I mean, just an amazing story. Wallah is one of the most uh, interesting uh, stories. And by the way, his son, so Abdullah, uh, as you know, Abdullah ibn Ubay uh, ibn Salul died in the lifetime of the Prophet ﷺ. It was his son 
who when his father died, he felt that softness, he felt that rahmah for him. He was the one who went to the Prophet and said, Ya Rasulullah, give me one of your cloaks, your, your rida, give me one of your uh, you know, garments that I will use as a kafan for my father. Perhaps Allah might forgive him. Again, this is in the end, there is rahmah. It's your father in the end of the day, you know. So the Prophet ﷺ not only gave him the rida, he went to the cemetery, he prayed janazah for This was before Allah revealed, don't. وَلَا تُصَلِّ عَلَىٰ أَحَدٍ مِنْهُ مَاتَ أَبَدًا وَلَا تَقُمْ عَلَىٰ قَبْرِ This is in Surah, uh, uh, surah Tawbah. And this was when Allah revealed, with, at the death of Abdullah ibn Ubay, Allah revealed never ever go to one of their graves and never stand at their graves and pray for them and never ask forgiveness for them. If you were to ask 70 times, Allah will not forgive. This came down after Abdullah ibn Ubay died. So before he actually went and he prayed for him and he وسلم, went into the grave himself to lower the body and he gave his own shroud to use as a kafan. Because subhanAllah, in the end of the day, he wanted rahmah. This is rahmat al alameen. He wanted even this person to get rahmah. That's his heart, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, we know better. And don't ask forgiveness for this person. You know he has died in uh, nifaq. And Abdullah ibn Ubay, uh, Abdullah ibn Abdullah ibn Ubay, the Muslim, he died a shaheed in the battles of Ridda uh, in the time of Abu Bakr al-Siddiq. So we really don't have much information about him. He lived a short life after this. He died within the next five, six years. Uh, he passed away. Now, uh, the outcome of this incident was that the true nature of Abdullah ibn Ubay was fully exposed now uh, by the text and testimony of the Qur'an in a manner that even Uhud had not done that explicitly. This is the most explicit. And therefore, many of the munafiqun abandoned Abdullah ibn Ubay and actually became true Muslims. When Allah Azza wa revealed what He revealed, and it was very clear, many of them abandoned, and they became true Muslims. And the Prophet وسلم, later remarked to Umar ibn al-Khattab that, what do you think, O Umar? Meaning about all that has happened. For indeed, if I had commanded him to be killed the day that you told me to kill him, I would have turned away many people, his followers, those same people, if I were to tell them to kill Abdullah ibn Ubay now, they would be the ones doing it. Do you understand? It's a long quote. But he's telling Umar, you were the one who wanted to kill him, right? What do you think now? You see the effects when those munafiqun embraced Islam, right? The Prophet said to Umar, you see? Do you remember that day? You wanted me to kill him. If I had killed him, all of these people would have remained hypocrites. But now, those people, if I were to tell them to kill Abdullah bin Ubay, they'd be the first ones to do it. Right? Their iman had now increased and they were now uh, true believers. And Umar ibn al-Khattab responded, Wallahi, I know that the ra'i or the opinion of the Prophet ﷺ is always more blessed than my opinion. I know that of course this was the correct opinion and your opinion will bring more barakah than my opinion. And uh, this incident of not killing Abdullah ibn Ubay, this is one of the main evidences and there are dozens of evidences and this is an issue of fiqh and usul al-fiqh. One of the main evidences of something known as maslaha. And maslaha means public welfare, the good of the people. That the Muslim ruler or the Muslim jurist or the Muslim faqih, he looks at the maslaha or what is good for the ummah and bases laws on maslaha. And the issue of maslaha is one of the sources of Islamic law. And these days especially, a lot is being written about it. If you look at many uh, organizations and many books and you just log on to any Islamic bookstore, lots of books about uh, maslaha. Uh, and there's no doubt that, uh, this is a whole long topic in of itself, but there's no doubt that maslaha is a source of law because our Prophet ﷺ took into account what would be the repercussions if he killed Abdullah ibn Ubay. He weighed the pros and the cons. And he said the cons outweigh the pros, basically. Right? If I were to kill him, what are the people going to think of this religion? What will they think of me killing my own father? They're not going to know he's a hypocrite. The perception will be what? The Prophet Muhammad is killing his own people. And I don't want them to say this about Islam. By the way, this also shows that 
There's, it's a part of our religion to have a good image in front of non-Muslims. PR is a part of every firm, every company, every group, every ethnicity, every religion. Some overzealous Muslims, they say, who cares what other people think about this? Here our Prophet is saying, I don't want people to think wrong about Islam. You have to think about the image you're giving to your religion. Not to your ego, not to yourself, to your faith, to your people. And that's why the Muslim always has to be extra scrupulous, extra careful, extra honest. There's an impression that has to be given, not for your sake. You people need to know this is what your religion teaches and practices. He says, I don't want the others to say, let not the non-Muslims say that Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi kills his own people. Even though Abdullah ibn Ubayd deserves the punishment. But what is the negatives of this punishment? It outweighs the positives. And this is the issue of Maslaha. Now just a footnote here. Maslaha is very popular in our times for one simple reason. And that is that uh, many of those whom I have called progressives and whatnot, they really like to harp on this point because they believe that Maslaha can be used to basically trump Islamic law. That if the Quran says X or if the Sunnah says Y, then they say, oh, Maslaha doesn't make sense, X doesn't make sense. Maslaha says, let's do something else. And this is one of the reasons why there's so much talk about Maslaha in our times. Yet in these very evidences, and this is what the classical four Sunni schools say, Maslaha is an evidence in the absence of an Islamic text. Not when there is an Islamic text. And even in this very incident, what does Umar conclude with? Wallahi, I know that the position of the Prophet is always going to have more barakah than my position. There is no maslaha in opposition to a text. Maslaha is used when the texts are silent. Texts are silent, now go ahead. What is public benefit? Let's discuss this. Bring together lawyers, bring together experts, bring together economists, bring together civil servants. Let's discuss how should the country be run. In areas where the sharia is silent, this is where maslaha comes into play. As for something that is explicit in the Quran or Sunnah that Allah has commanded, the maslaha is in obeying the command. Whether we see it or not, and that's really the whole point in our times why the issue of maslaha, and there are certain organizations, well, there's one organization that has released over 10 books in English in the last three years about maslaha. Over 10 books, all of its books about maslaha. Maslaha and Islamic law, you know, all of this issue. What is the, what is the reason? As I said, the goal is to kind of chip away from the texts of the Quran and Sunnah, and we, or at least I personally, do not at all agree with this. Maslaha is only used in the absence of a text, and not to discredit a text. And this is what the four madhahib all say. Okay, so this is the second of the third issue, and that is the issue of Abdullah ibn Ubay, and what he said. Now we get to the third, and this will last us all of the remainder and also next week and also the week after that. This is the very long story about the slander of Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha. And the slander of Aisha is one of the most traumatic stories in the seerah for one simple reason, because it deals with the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam's personal and intimate affairs. It deals with the very personal bond of a husband and wife. It deals with the honor and the sanctity of marriage. And it shows us how low the munafiqun went. Like you cannot go lower than this. This is like you have no scruples to go that low. And it was a very traumatic time. And one of the uh, interesting things about this story is that it has been preserved in vivid detail in the first person by Aisha herself in the most authentic books. There are a hadith that are two, three, four pages long in Bukhari that Aisha is describing in her own narrative, in her own memory, from her own memory, the whole story of the slander. And therefore, this is even more beneficial and interesting because we see it from the perspective of the main victim, of the main person of the story. And therefore, all of the 
talks and the books written about the story of the slander, they revolve around Aisha herself. Because you cannot get more detailed information than Aisha herself. And uh, as we said, these stories are narrated in Bukhari and Muslim, so they are the most authentic uh, books. And what I'm going to do is to basically quote you exactly what Aisha herself said, uh, obviously the translation, and then just give some fawaid or benefits directly from what she has said. I've translated this very long hadith, bringing in other narrations as well. I've translated it uh, into English, and uh, all of these narrations, as we said, are found in uh, Sahih al-Bukhari. And Aisha uh, begins and she says that uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam whenever he wanted to go on a journey <coughs> he would cast lots amongst his wives. So whoever's lot would be picked that wife would accompany the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Now the meaning here of course is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was fair with all of his wives in matters that he could control. But if there's one journey you cannot take all of them. And how are you going to choose for every journey which one to take? It's not fair to alternate because every journey is different. So what, it would, have, what would happen? He would draw lots. Lots meaning like, you know, take six, seven straws, one of them is long, all of the are short, and then, you know, you just pick, and then whoever picks the, the long straw, that's the one that is its turn. So this shows us that drawing lots in this manner, for halal reasons, uh, this is something that all of the fuqaha allow. And there are many cases in fiqh, there are many cases in fiqh, uh, hypothetically if there were slavery, so if a slave uh, uh, owner says, when I die, free one of my slaves, and he has, let's say, five slaves, how do you decide? So you have to draw lots. So there's many cases in the books of fiqh that drawing lots is actually a part of sharia. You actually have to draw lots to have a fair uh, pick if you like. And this also shows us that uh, the Prophet wasallam would sometimes take his wives. Sometimes. And this is the exception and not the rule in war. And he would only take them when the victory was pretty much confirmed such as Muraisiyah. As again we said Muraisiyah was like a, it's a given. There is no question that they will f complete surprise attack, they're outnumber, sorry, they're outnumbering the enemy. It's very clear there's no problem going to happen. So it's the exception to take women, but it has been narrated that sometimes uh, the Prophet ﷺ did uh, take women in some expeditions. So he cast lots on one of his expeditions. Uh, in this version, she doesn't mention Muraisiyah. We learned from other books, it is Muraisiyah. So my name came up. So I was the one who accompanied him in Muraisiyah. So I traveled with the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and this was after the verses of hijab had been revealed. When were the verses of hijab revealed? Maybe we can find out when did Muraisiyah take place. Sadly, it doesn't matter to us because the verses of hijab were revealed at the end of the fourth year of the hijrah. So either fifth or sixth doesn't matter. That doesn't help us. Okay? The Verses of hijab were revealed Dhul Qa'da of the fourth year of the hijrah. Right? And I mentioned when I teach the class about the fiqh of clothing and the fiqh of food, I mentioned that the verses of hijab were of the last commandments to be revealed after salah, after zakah, after inheritance, after fasting Ramadan, after zakatul fitr, right? After marriage and divorce, which is in Baqarah. The verses of hijab were of the very last commandments to be revealed in terms of the personal dietary laws and whatnot, right? No doubt hijab is important, but I point out that I think many of us have made hijab even more important than the salah. It's like we immediately decide instantaneously based on the hijab. No doubt hijab is important, but put it in its place. It was revealed at the end of the fourth year, not at the beginning of the first year like the salah or something, okay? None that actually the salah was pre hijab excuse me. The zakah was the beginning of the first year and, and all that. And nonetheless, so she said, so the verses of hijab had been revealed, and therefore I would travel in a haudaj. A haudaj. What is a haudaj? It's a mini tent, if you like. We all are familiar with it, uh, and it's basically uh, something you put on the camel, and it is an envelope, it's like a small tent that a person can sit uh, inside. Canopy something you put on the canvas, a canopy that a person can sit in. And to this day, some cultures, they use it, uh, you know, a person is carried in it or something. We see it on television in the old days. People would carry a nobleman, you know, four people would carry. This is the haudaj. And then you put it on the camel. Now, 
the hijab of the Prophet's wives was extra. The hijab of the Prophet's wives was extra. And the wives of the Prophet they had to be covered not just in their personal body, but their space as well had to be covered. And this was only for the wives of the Prophet and this is explicit in the Qur'an. Explicit in the Qur'an. Uh, the Qur'an says, وَإِذَا سَأَلْتُمُوهُنَّ مَتَاعًا فَاسْأَلُوهُنَّ مِنْ وَرَاءِ حجاب. If you ask the wives of the Prophet ﷺ for anything, if you talk to them, speak to them from behind a hijab. And this is what Aisha is saying, that this incident of Muraysi took place after the verses of hijab. The term hijab in the Qur'an, I'm going into a tangent here, but it's something we should know. It's very important. The term hijab in the Qur'an does not mean headscarf. In our vernacular, it means a headscarf. We say, does she wear hijab? I started wearing the hijab, means the headscarf. This is modern Arabic, which is fine, not a, not a problem. Quranic Arabic, the hijab meant a physical curtain that separates the entire body, not just on your body. It's a curtain between you and the speaker. This is the Quranic usage of hijab. And this usage of hijab, according to the Quran, only the wives of the Prophet ﷺ have to wear, not wear, excuse me, have to enforce that type of hijab. As for the headscarf, the Quran references this with the term khimar. With the term khimar. وَالْيَضْرِبْنَ بِخُمُرِهِنَّ عَلَىٰ جُيُوبِهِنَّ let them wear their khimar, khumur, plural of uh, khimar, over their juyub, which is their bosoms. Their scarves should cover their chests as well. Because the women of Jahiliya, by the way, they would wear headscarves, by the way. The women of Jahiliya would wear a headscarf. Every respectable, dignified lady would cover her hair, just like in America 100 years ago. Impossible for a dignified lady. Only the peasants and the rural people without money, without education, they would be with. And the same in Arabia. Every single lady of respect and of middle class would wear a headscarf. But, just like in America as well, the headscarf would be thrown back and the dresses get lower and lower. You get the point. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, No. When you wear the headscarf, cover the bosom. Right? So, anyway, the point here, Aisha says the verses of hijab had been revealed. And by this we mean an extra layer above and beyond the khimar, above and beyond the jilbab, which is another Quranic term. Right? يَا أَيُّهُ النَّبِيُّ يَا أَقُلْ لِأَزْوَاجِكَ وَبَنَاتِكَ وَنِسَاءِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ يُدْنِينَ عَلَيْهِنَّ مِنْ جَلَابِيبِهِنَّ That's another verse. So, the khimar and jilbab is mentioned for all women. The mothers of the believers, the wives of the Prophet <coughs> <coughs> the daughters of the Prophet and all of the women. Khimar and jilbab. And this is what our sisters wear. For the wives of the Prophet there's only the hijab. Now, a reason I say this, by the way, and it's very important, I know it's not directly related. These days you will hear some modernists or progressives say, the hijab was only for the wives of the Prophet And this is a technically true statement that is intended for something false. This is a technically true statement. It's a true statement, but something evil is intended through it. It is true. The Quranic hijab is only for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. But what is the Quranic hijab? It is this extra layer of curtain. Right? Whereas what these people try to say is that the hijab, meaning how we understand it, which is the khimar and chilbab, is only for the wives of the Prophet ﷺ. And this is wallahi foolishness that shows a complete ignorance of the Quran. It's so explicit. Ya azwajika wa banatika wa nisa'il mu'minina. Tell your wives and your daughters and the believing women 
Yudnina alayhinna min jalabi bihin. They should all cover themselves with a jilbab. This is in the Quran. The word jilbab and the word khimar as well. That all believing women, wal yadribna bi khumurihinna alaj. All believing women, including the wives of the Prophet. And Aisha would wear a khimar and she would wear a jilbab, but she would also have a hijab. Right? So in any case, getting back to the story now. So she's saying, this was after the verses of hijab. So she's explaining, why am I in a hodaj? Why am I in a canopy? Because she, unlike any other woman, she cannot ride a camel anymore. The, the figure of Aisha could not be seen in public. The figure, even completely covered. She has to be always in that canopy. And in her house as well, nobody can speak to her except from behind the curtain. Right? And that is why the only person, uh, the main narrator from Aisha was her nephew, Urwa, because he's a mahram. So Urwa did not have to speak from behind the hijab. Urwa could enter from, you know, and speak to her from behind the hijab. Whereas all of the other people spoke from, from on the other side of the hijab. So he, she said that after the expedition finished and we were on the way back, the Prophet ﷺ gave orders to encamp the night outside of Medina. Now, this is the night where the munafiqun have basically lost, right? You need to understand why this is happening now. Why are the hypocrites going to stoop to such a, a, a low level? This is that night now. The night when Abdullah ibn Ubay has been exposed. The night when the Quran has been revealed, Surah Al-Munafiqun has come down, right? When there's so much anger that he has, and now Allah Azza wa has exposed his plot, so now he's exacting revenge in a manner that is so unmanly and so unbecoming, it really shows the depths of the darkness of his heart. Right? We need to understand the context of why this is taking place at this point in time. After all that's happened, khalas, this is how he's going to get revenge. La hawla wa la quds illa billah. This is that night now, the one night before Medina, the last step. So, the uh, Aisha says that when the orders were given to encamp, <coughs> I stood up and walked away from the army to relieve myself, so nobody saw her. That basically, as we said, everybody fell asleep, they were completely out. And she went far away distance, she wanted to relieve herself. On the way back, I felt my chest, and lo and behold, my onyx necklace. Onyx is a whitish translucent rock. It's just a stone. Necklace had been broken. I panicked and I went back to find it and I spent a long time trying to find the necklace. She couldn't find it. Okay, now, the necklace has sentimental value and this shows her simplicity. SubhanAllah, she's not, she is the most beloved wife of the most beloved Prophet of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And what is she wearing? Gold, diamonds, rubies, what are the wives of the pharaohs wearing? What are the wives of the kings wearing? What is the wife of our Prophet wearing? Basically, quartz stone. Stone that you just pick up and it's shiny. This is what she's wearing. That's her, and it's sentimental. This is the Prophet's gift to her. So she wants to keep it. So she doesn't find it. She goes and she panics. She goes looking for it everywhere. Where did it go? And because of this, she was delayed. The people assigned to my Hawdaj, in the meantime, the orders were given to move. Now, she's not telling us this part, but we know from the other story, everybody's dead tired. Everybody's crashed because of what's happened. They wake up, the command to go, you can imagine how tired they are. You can imagine the city is one, one day away now. That's it, this is the last step, right? So, you know, they're just, they didn't pay that much attention. And then Aisha makes an excuse for them. And she said that, uh, I myself was a young girl, I had not put on much weight, I was very light. So when they picked up the hodaj, they didn't realize I was not in it. SubhanAllah, she's narrating this incident 50 years later without mentioning any of their names, but she's still excusing them. It's not their fault, cut them some slack. In case any of you felt anything, don't worry, really, it's... I, I was a young girl, I didn't weigh much, you know, I hadn't grown old, I didn't put on any weight. You know, it's like they didn't realize I was not there. SubhanAllah, look at her innocence here. We even sense it from the beginning, that she's making excuses for uh, the people uh, that, did it, that they didn't notice her in the uh, Hawdaj. So the men did not question the likeness, they put it on the camel, and they sent the camel forward. And when I returned to the camp, there was not a single person in sight. 
خلاص, the whole camp has gone. Which shows us that she really panicked about the necklace. She spent some time looking everywhere. And we can imagine she's a young girl at this time and she's sentimentally attached to this necklace. And, you know, she's panicking, where did I drop it? And lo and behold, the necklace was underneath the camel. It was right there. It wasn't anywhere over there. It was over there. When I came back, it's over there. And everybody had uh, abandoned. There was not a soul in uh, sight. And uh, she said, I stayed in my place. By the way, the men in the Aisha's camp, in the Aisha's Hawdaj, would not speak to her, obviously, out of adab and out of respect. They would not converse with her. So it's, you know, there's no question of them verifying, are you there? It's just, there's a huge amount of protocol of respect. This is the wife of the Prophet ﷺ. No talking. You just let her be. So, I stayed in my place and I presumed that, you know, as soon as they discovered I was missing, they would return for me. And while I was waiting in my place, sitting under a tree, I fell asleep. This is a brave young girl. Completely alone in the desert. Not a drop of food or water. She's like, falls asleep. They'll find me, don't worry. She has confidence. Allah Azza wa is going to take care, don't worry. And she actually falls asleep. And I only woke up when I heard a man say, La hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And lo and behold, it was Safwan ibn Mu'attal as sulami Safwan ibn Mu'attal as sulami who was lagging behind the army. Now, Safwan ibn Mu'attal, it was his qadr that he overslept the whole order to leave. <laughs> he was so tired he just completely was bonked out everybody left and he's still asleep and he's way behind so now he takes his camel and he starts slowly making his way back to Medina and he sees this figure in the desert all alone and lo and behold it is Aisha and Aisha says and he had seen me before the verse of the hijab came down, so he recognized me. Now this is one of the evidences that scholars use that in those days niqab was more common. Because he recognized her because he had seen her without the niqab. Right? That's another issue of the niqab or not. And so he recognized me because he had seen me before the uh, revelation of the hijab. So when I woke up and I saw him, she said, I covered my face with my jilbab. Because she was asleep. So I covered my face with my jilbab. It shows us here uh, the intelligence of Aisha. It shows us the Sahaba when something happened, they would make adhkar. Subhanallah, alhamdulillah, la hawla la khusila billah. Sadly, when something happens to us, astaghfirullah, we use curse words. It's a very, very bad habit. And we really need to get rid of this. We need to substitute those words. We need to make it a part of our fitrah to say things from the sunnah. Alhamdulillah, astaghfirullah, la hawla la quwwata billah, subhanallah. Instead of cursing, instead of, even if it's not a vulgar curse, saying things like stupid or fool or saying, why? Why? Use phrases that are more Islamic. If you don't like something, subhanallah, la hawla la quwwata billah, Allahu Akbar. Something great happens, alhamdulillah. This is the way of the sunnah. And when you put it a part of your habit, this is what's going to happen. That when something happens instantaneously, a, a, a word of praise comes out. And this should be uh, ingrained in us. And it's also a positive thing for da'wah as well. That when something happens, you say something like this, guys are going to ask, what, what did you mean by this? What happens? And it's a very positive sign. Oh, I thanked God. Alhamdulillah. <coughs> right, inshallah. This is a part of our uh, culture and vernacular. So, Safwan ibn Mu'attil, uh, or Safwan ibn Mu'attal is the proper way. Safwan ibn Mu'attal, uh, and he was from the tribe of As-Sulami. Uh, Safwan ibn Mu'attal, he said, La hawla la quwwata billah. And Aisha says, I swear by Allah, he did not speak one word to me. All he did was he lowered the camel, walked away so that I could ride on it so that she doesn't even see her getting on the camel. Turned his back so that let him let her get on the camel, right? And then he guided the camel with his hands all the way back to Medina. He walked and she was on the camel. Subhanallah, this is a gentleman. And this is, any of us would do this, inshallah, with our, uh, the mother of the believers, Aisha, radiallahu ta'ala anha. He guided the, car the, the camel uh, until it reached, basically, uh, the 
uh, group before it entered Medina. Okay, so they caught up with the group. They caught up with the group, and of course, who was at the back of the group? Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. That's the standard place of the hypocrites, right at the end of the army. Right? And so, Aisha says, that was when the rumors began to spread by Abdullah ibn Ubay ibn Salul. And Safan ibn Mu'attal, by the way, he was a very noble companion. Uh, and in fact, he, was, he had never been married up to this point in time. He only got married after this. He was a, a single man. He was a very noble man. And he died actually a shaheed uh, in the time of Umar ibn Khattab fighting in Armenia. His grave is in Armenia. Uh, he died in the, uh, the battle that conquered Armenia. And he died a shaheed in the reign of Umar uh, ibn al-Khattab. Uh, and then Aisha says, and I guess we should stop here because this is when the story takes, uh, the, 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 the real things begin. Aisha says that when I came to uh, Medina, uh, I fell sick with a fever for one whole month. And so I was oblivious to the rumors as it was spreading around. For one month I was sick with a fever and I did not hear anything. In this one month what happened, the rumors began to grow bigger and bigger and bigger. And as they're growing bigger and bigger, Aisha is completely oblivious because she has a severe burning fever and she's not in the circle of friends she usually is in and she's cut off from all of the gossip. And so this contributed as well that she's basically cut off, nobody's seeing her and on top of this, uh, the uh, for one month, uh, the rumors uh, spread. One very, very beautiful thing, subhanAllah, about the books of the seerah, and it really shows us their own adab, the authors. They never mention the actual rumor. It's just understood. And it shows, subhanAllah, it's so disgusting, you don't even want to hint at it. It's just called the slander. Khalas, that's it. No book of seerah, no book ever verbalizes the slander. And it's such an, uh, it really shows us the etiquettes of our early scholars. And you compare this to the attitude of modern society, where every graphic detail and every minutiae and every sordid issue wants to be spread on the front page news. It's disgusting, wallahi, it's disgusting. Our religion says, even if something happens, just don't talk about it. Cover it up. This is what we learn from this story as well, right? That even if something happens and you hear about it, don't spread it to others. Because, and this wallahi we see around us, the more you spread fahisha, forget even fahisha, the more you spread violence, the more you're going to desensitize people to violence. The more you spread vulgarity, the more vulgar people will become. The more you talk about murders and, and, and mass killers and whatnot, what's going to happen? Murder becomes common, no big deal. Mass killing is astaghfirullah even common now, right? It's just so sad. Whereas, by and large, I mean, we don't hear really of people in quote unquote third world countries walking into kindergarten school and killing 30, 40, 50 people. This is not something that is common in most parts of the world. But what happens when you raise an entire generation desensitized to all types of evil, what's going to happen? They will accept this evil and they're going to continue to raise the bar. They're going to continue to raise the bar. And this is what we see even in the adab of our own scholars. You don't even mention, just reference it indirectly, the slander of Aisha. Right? And with this, inshallah, uh, we'll pause here because the real story will begin, inshallah, uh, uh, next uh, Wednesday. And we have, inshallah, five minutes of questions. But before that, I was told to make an announcement uh, about the PVS fundraiser. Who has the details? Uh, yes, the PVS fundraiser is told to make an announcement. So I don't know the details. So if you can uh, make the uh, encouragement, inshallah, and then I can add to that. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, this Sunday, um, the annual PBS fundraiser is uh, going to take place, insha'Allah. Um, so, I think it starts at um, uh, 6 o'clock, uh, 5 o'clock, and 30, uh, this program will start. So, um, a lot of good things are happening. Actually, as we speak tonight, the PBS is uh, won uh, uh, Science Fair Awards in the West Regional. They, play, they took num place number one in middle school, and I think we're going to take, play in, take uh, second place in high school. So 
think about that is the West Tennessee regions. So we're going to go to states. And we did the history first, recently, like that. So we are blessed by Allah uh, by competing with schools that charged 16,000 and we charge 4,000. And we are winning, and our children are winning. So we need, this is the grace of Allah and the support of the community. So we really need your support. And the children and the people who do it every day, that day in and day out support, they need your support, they need your presence, they need your dua. So, Jazakumullah khair. Jazakumullah khair. From my own side as well, really, uh, Allah, we're very blessed and fortunate to have an Islamic school in Memphis. Uh, and uh, we can do, we really need to do whatever we can to help them out. Even if your kids don't go there, this is a community school. We're very proud that, alhamdulillah, Memphis has a purpose-built school. Um, I'm always supportive of them. All of my kids, you know, are there. My wife is teacher there. I mean, as much as I can support them, you know, we're supporting them. And wallahi, we're very happy. So whatever you guys can do, just to participate, just to give whatever you can, alhamdulillah, it's, uh, you know, a great uh, blessing for Memphis to have uh, PVS school. Alhamdulillah. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions, inshallah. Any other announcements, by the way, before I forget? No other announcements. Okay. A few minutes for questions, inshallah. Bismillah. Yes. Uh, there's a, I guess some opinions of scholars or maybe some common, like, uh, belief that the ra'i or the reasoning in the fifth of Umar and Allah were the wrong during the time of the Prophet was not wrong. But the example that you went through today, uh, where Umar Umar Khattab himself admitted that the Prophet was right, was was superior, and was uh, he was right, uh, so uh, showed otherwise. Is this a, a, like belief about the Maslaha, uh, where Umar Khattab weigh in, like with the prisoners executing them, or is this just like a wrong? Okay. So the question is about the Umar's uh, ra'is or positions. <coughs> Sometimes it appears that he was right, but then today it appears he's wrong. Actually, Umar ibn Khattab himself says that uh, I agree with my Lord in three matters. In other words, three of my positions, Allah confirmed them. And then he mentions three cases that happened that whatever position he had, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then uh, affirmed them. Uh, right now only two come to mind, perhaps one of when you can remind you. One of them was the issue of the prisoners of war. And the other one was the issue of the hijab. He was the one who said that, uh, Ya Rasulullah, you should enforce hijab on your wives because the munafiqun and, and others will speak bad of them. And that did happen with the munafiqun. Uh, but he was the one who suggested this. And there was a third one, I don't remember it now. No, that's not the... Are you sure that's the one? Maybe that's the Tallahu Alaihi In any case, I don't want to say for sure. I forgot now what it was. Uh, but so he said, my Lord agreed with me in three things. And out of Adab, he said, sorry, he said, I agreed with my Lord in three things. And he said this out of Adab, because technically he said this, then Allah revealed. But he said, I agreed with, uh, you know, Allah, not my Lord agreed with me. Because that's obviously not very polite to say. Uh, but this doesn't mean that every single position of his was right. And we have multiple times where Umar ibn al-Khattab had a position, but later on it was proven to be wrong. And this is one of them. And the clearest example of this that we're going to come to later on is the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. And when he became Khalifa, Umar ibn al-Khattab said that, O oh people, Suspect your own opinions before you suspect the Quran. Suspect your own ara before you suspect the Quran. Because I remember that on a particular day, meaning Hudaybiyah, I almost became a kafir. He said this of himself. By rejecting what the Prophet had wanted us to do. And because Umar he himself admitted he lost it on the day of Hudaybiyah. When the Prophet ﷺ said, Khalas, shave your hair, let's go back. We're not going to go to Mecca. We'll allow them to stop us from entering Mecca. Umar could not handle this. You're going to listen to these people and they're going to stop us from entering the Kaaba and we have every right to enter and do tawaf and we're just going to shave our hairs and go back, khalas, like this. And he came and he said, Are you not Rasulullah ﷺ? He said, yes, I am. Are you not upon the truth? Yes, I am. Then how can we accept humiliation in our religion? 
there was this sense of zealousy, this zealousness, this... Yeah, and you know, it's still common in our times, you know, that type of, how is this possible? And it was Abu Bakr, the Prophet did not respond to the matter. It was Abu Bakr who held on to him and said, calm down, O man, literally. like The Arabic is like, calm down, O man. Are you going to reject Islam because of this? What is your, I mean, basically, Abu Bakr, who's the gentle, the meek guy, only Abu Bakr had the audacity and the courage to hold on to his beard and shake him like this, right? So, Later on in his life, Umar said, I saw myself almost become a kafir on that day. Meaning, what does he mean by this? He's being obviously modest, he's being exaggerating a little bit, he's not going to become a kafir, but he's saying, by rejecting the Prophet's command, not by rejecting his risala, right? By rejecting his command, that I found myself, I couldn't admit that I'm just going to go back to Medina without performing Umrah and listening to these people uh, when they stop us from going. And then he said, uh, uh, <coughs> What did he say after this? That, uh, yeah. So he said, "وَفَعَلْتُ لِذَلِكَ أَفْعَالًا That I made up for that day by doing many good deeds. And Ibn Hajar comments when he when Ibn when he has this. Ibn Hajar comments he freed many dozens of slaves and he fasted many hundreds of years for the rest of his life. Yani he felt so guilty for that one day, right? That the rest of his life was like an atonement for that one day, right? That he has to make up for all that he's done. So the point being. It is true that uh, many of the positions of Umar were correct, but it is also true that some of them were incorrect, and this is human nature. This is human nature, that uh, in the, when the Prophet is alive, he is the ultimate authority. After he goes away, then no doubt Abu Bakr and Umar are the greatest authorities, but they are not infallible. They're not infallible. Yes? His maslaha was the reason that uh, Ali Abi Talib did not speak the killers of Islam. The issue of Ali and the killers of Uthman is really a very complicated one. And no doubt it is maslaha, but why and what is the, you know, the detailed reasons and wallahi it's, you know, very difficult to say for certain, but most likely it was simply the quantity of killers and the backlash that would have happened from the riffraff of that quantity that he would have had to kill. It would have led to a bigger civil war. And Allah knows best. I mean, this is what he felt that at this point in time, let's just consol consolidate the ummah and move on. It was a time of fitna and chaos and generally we like to avoid, this is our Sunni methodology. It is actually a part of our theology to kind of gloss over that period and era. And Allah knows best. Final question, yes? Good. On this trip, as far as, no, only Aisha was on this trip. But on other trips, we have stories of Maimuna going, of other wives going. But on this trip, it was only Aisha, the wife of the Prophet. Inshallah, with this, we will uh, break for Salah and inshallah, resume this topic next Wednesday. And of course, next Tuesday.